um, in procurement for manufacturing. So he was going all over the world and traveling away from his family and his wife who can't drink coffee, he started getting tea gifts for her on his travels. Um, which benefits us because he decided to turn it into a business. So he um, traded his his manufacturing hat in and decided to start doing loose leaf tea here in Omaha. Um, and from the beginning, he's been really great about sourcing high quality Japanese teas. Um, a lot of our Japanese high quality teas come from Shizuoka. So I will talk a little bit about those today. Um, and you can also visit me uh, just outside in the tent. Um, I'll be tasting those in the tent today. So if you'd like to try any of these, um, I should have some there available for you to taste. Uh, just come say hi. And so, Anyway, uh, Tea in Japan really got its start during the Song Dynasty of China. During the Song Dynasty of China, there were Buddhist monks that brought tea plants and tea over to Japan. And they brought it primarily as a meditation aid. So at that time, tea was being ground down into a powder and frothed, or as they say, beaten with a bamboo brush into a froth in a bowl. So during the Song Dynasty of China, uh, that tea that they were whisking, uh, beating with a brush, was a black tea. It was not as high quality as you're seeing these days. Um, but a black tea beaten into a froth is going to have a white froth on top. So a lot of the bowls that you would see from that period are going to be dark because they want the froth to be a different color than, than the bowl because the froth was very prized. So when you see a matcha tea ceremony from Japan, it's like this little window into the past of Chinese tea culture uh, and preserved at that point. But it's preserved in this unique Japanese way. Uh, in the late 800s, early 900s is really when Japanese tea started to come to being. Um, and during that time, they, there was a big cultural interchange between Japan and China. Um, and they eventually codified that, that tea ceremony into what we now know as the Cha No Yu ceremony. Um, the person that really codified that ceremony is Seno Rikyu. Uh, Seno Rikyu kind of developed a few primary points of the Cha no Yu, um, really taking a look at the simplicity, because prior to Seno Rikyu, they had loads and loads of decorations. Uh, it was a little excessive, so he brought it back to bare bones and appreciating nature and the Zen qualities that you see through the, the Chano Yu that we know today. Um, but interestingly enough, early on in tea culture in Japan, they would have these lavish parties of tea tasting where there would be all kinds of foods and, and sweets and different teas and you would win prizes for uh, guessing where a particular tea came from. Apparently, Shogun Tokugawa 
is renowned for having drank tea almost exclusively from the Honyama area of Shizuoka. So, um, and today you will be able to taste some teas that I have from Honyama Shizuoka. I actually have a Shincha, which Shincha means new tea. So Shincha is the very first harvest of tea in the season. That's the very first picking of tea in early spring. So they'll be picking that early April usually, depending on the weather. Um, and then later on, you get a Sencha. So Sencha is really um, iconic of Japanese tea. So we've got a sencha. So sencha is going to be a springtime picking of tea. It's not quite the shincha. Shincha is the very first harvest. Um, but then later on into the summer and early fall you get a bancha. So then with the bancha you can roast a bancha to create what's called hojicha. Hojicha looks nice and brown, but it still is a green tea. Uh, the reason it's still a green tea is that it is processed as a green tea. They stop the oxidation prior to the oxygen interacting with an enzyme in the tea leaf and creating different uh, flavor aspects, breaking down the antioxidants into what becomes a black tea or even an oolong tea. Um, now, so if you go into the tea history, you have the culture really um, having an interchange of ideas, language, art, between Japan and China, and then you have the isolation period. At about 1300, anybody help me with the dates on that? Do you guys know? Oh, my heart. Okay, well, around 13, 1400, um, you have the beginning of the isolation period in Japan. Um, so during the isolation period, uh, just prior to that, they started to see teas coming out of China that were loose, as opposed to in bricks that they broke down and crushed. Um, so, and ground down into a powder. Um, so, with the matcha ceremony, you see a, a look into Song Dynasty China tea preparation. Whereas the loose tea preparation is what started to come after the Emperor of China decided that tea was um, making his currency unstable because people were trading tea in place of his currency. So the Emperor of China decided that he would appreciate the tea leaves and that a part of tea culture should be seeing this beautiful tea, smelling this beautiful tea, a whole sensory experience. And then, so going into the isolation period of Japan, you start to see loose leaf tea, but they didn't know how to make it. They created their own way of producing tea in isolation period Japan. So green teas in China, are they stop the oxidation process through a dry heat. They'll roast the tea leaves, pan fire the tea leaves. But in Japan, they're really all about preserving the health benefits of the tea. So there was one gentleman in Japan in about 1840 something who had this grand idea to
to stop the oxidation process in the tea leaves using steam. So the Japanese from then on started to use steam to dehydrate their tea, interestingly enough. So then all of these Japanese green teas have this beautiful vegetal, spinachy, seaweedy quality and the health benefits are preserved that much more. Um, during the isolation period, about 80% of the population of Japan were rice farmers. And so we get genmaicha. Genmaicha has the genmai, the toasted rice, toasted and popped rice in it. Because what do rice farmers have? They have rice. Uh, and tea was primarily really expensive and, and it was given mostly to the upper classes. So the rice farmers would extend the tea that they did get using their rice. So then we get genmaicha. Genmaicha is this beautiful tea. You can sample it today as well. Um, but it's fresh and grassy and bright, but it also has this lovely uh, cereally warm quality to it from the rice. Beautiful. Uh, now, during the processing of sencha, they take out the twiggy bits. So the twig bits go into this tea called kukicha. Kukicha is probably my favorite tea ever. It has this beautiful grassy taste to it, but it's balanced out and it's rounded. So kukicha is lower in caffeine because the twiggy bits of the leaf don't have as much caffeine in it, but they have more L-theanine amino acid in them. Uh, L-theanine amino acid, they've done so many studies on to show that it helps your body to process cortisol, your stress hormone. Um, so I love kukicha primarily for that reason. Um, but L-theanine also rounds out the flavor. It creates this wonderful umami to it. Um, and they've done studies on L-theanine that show that it's beneficial for people with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's beneficial for people with ADHD and assisting in regulation of their sleep patterns. Amazing stuff. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of smart coffee. It was a thing a while back. They would take l and and add it to coffee. Just have a cup of tea. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Okay, I got a few more minutes. Um, so we've got Sencha, the one that I have today is Sencha Shinroku. Uh, we also have Shincha, which is amazing and beautiful. Uh, there's the Genmaicha, which has the toasted rice in it. And then there's the Kukicha, which is made at the same time as the Sencha. But we also have Gyokuro. Gyoku, Gyokuro is, uh, translates to Jade Dew basically. Um, so this one is a beautiful tea. We're a little low in stock, so I didn't bring it today. Um, but it's buttery and sweet, and it's just absolutely amazing. It's the cream of the crop. They uh, shade grow that for three weeks prior to harvesting it. up in the hills of Shizuoka. They've got these screens that they pull over the tea plants and allow the, the tea plants to struggle. And that struggle from less light, uh, just it causes the L-theanine to increase, 
the caffeine to increase also, um, and the antioxidants as well. And you can tell, too, that the chlorophyll is just that much more. Because when a plant needs to get its nutrients, uh, do its photosynthesis process, um, it needs to produce more chlorophyll in order to get the energy it needs out of the sun. So you can see those things in the tea itself. Um, and um, gyokuro is actually all hand harvested, which is kind of unique in Japan. Um, a lot of the Japanese teas are harvested with these big hedge trimmers. Usually these two-man hedge trimmers. One, uh, one side there's a guy holding, holding the, the handles and they're just going along the rows that are about two people deep and the other guys on the other side and they take these hedge trimmers that have all of these tiny little shears going through that, that um, sense how high the tea plant is and so it cuts it to a certain length. It's pretty amazing stuff. The technology that is used in the Japanese tea harvesting and processing is just amazing to me. Um, my boss, Tim, just went to Shizuoka with the Shizuoka Committee Association. Um, and before, when he went, this is what a matcha grinding room would look like before. Now, they don't let you take pictures, but rather than grinding the matcha on a granite mill, they grind it, the culinary, they'll grind it with air. It's basically in a cyclone inside. It's amazing. And then the ceremonial, it's a ball grinder. Amazing. So completely different looking than these old mills that, here's, here's one that's taken apart. There's the top and the bottom. Um, the tea just goes down in the middle and it comes out all of these little channels in a powder form eventually. So part of the reason for the switch is because when you have friction, you are heating the tea up and you have the potential to oxidize the tea a little bit. Um, so the two things that, that make tea primarily go off its flavor are air and light. So part of that is because you don't wanna put your tea next to your onions it absorbs those flavors. Just saying, don't put your tea by your onions or your garlic. That would um, give you some rather soupy tasting beverages. But interestingly enough, that's how they first started drinking tea. They first started drinking tea in China by adding it to their soup as a leafy green vegetable. Um, so, Moral of the story now, uh, keep your tea by itself. Um, if you are going to put your tea in your refrigerator, I like to put my matcha in the refrigerator. Um, keep it in the fridge up until the time you open it. When you open it, you'll probably want to consume it within about a month. Um, because, so once you open it, it opens to the air and there's moisture in the air. So that, that tea, that powdery tea, will wind up getting some, wrapping the, the moisture particles from the air with tea and powder. So then you'll wind up with like little balls of tea in your tea tin and you don't really want that if you put it back in the fridge. In and out of the fridge, it, 
introduces more moisture to it. Um, so, something special that I did bring today is I did bring Tencha. Tencha is the tea leaf that is fixed prior to grinding down into matcha. So I do have some of the Tencha. It's really unique to even uh, obtain any of that. But what's also unique to obtain, and I brought to taste today, I didn't bring any to sell, uh, but I brought a Japanese oolong, and I brought a Japanese black tea. Um, the majority of teas that are produced in Japan are green teas. Um, so those green teas are extremely healthy. The very first book that was written on tea in Japan, in Japanese, the title roughly translates to drinking tea for health or drinking tea for longer life, which is kind of evident in the processing of green tea in Japan. That's why they use the steam to preserve all of the healthy benefits of green tea. Um, but now, in the last 10 years or so, Japan has started to produce a little bit of oolong and a little bit of black tea. And they've even started to produce a little bit of what's called dark tea, um, fermented tea. So dark tea that is um, from Yunnan province in China will be known as poor. If it comes from anywhere else in the world, it's known as dark tea. Um, I don't have any of that. Maybe we'll get some eventually, but it tends to be extremely expensive. But come and visit me over at the, the tent today. Um, you can definitely try some teas. I'll even bring out my uh, private stash of ceremonial grade matcha. So come and say hi. I'll share my matcha with you. And questions too. So. That's my daughter. <laughs> what? Oh, you ran out of both of the teas. I'll brew up some more when we get over. Okay, I'll brew up some more. 